All right, I've got lots of pages of notes, and I'm going to do my best to, to try to get through this quickly. Um, don't get too intimidated by how many notes I have. Just there's a lot of scripture references. I'm not necessarily going to expound through all of them, but there's a lot that I want to bring up this evening, and I'm gonna we're going to go through chapter 13 relatively quickly because what I want to do though is draw your attention to the similarities that we see here in chapter 13 with other references to the day of the Lord because that's what chapter 13 is is ultimately referencing primarily here the day of the Lord and this is an event that is a very a very very pivotal event in the Bible and this is something that's really important to understand and and understand the timing of and and, and what's going to happen and when you understand, and I preached on this in the past, and this is, I, I think this is, um, in my opinion, for the way that I see things at least, and, and you know, maybe you share the same opinion, but like, when it comes to understanding events in the Bible, or especially Bible prophecy, things that haven't happened yet, uh, there's a lot of different teachings out there. There's all kinds of, of people who are saying all kinds of different things to the point to where it could be confusing if you're not settled and if you haven't seen this, if you don't understand. Uh, because people will put out all kinds of different theories and, and, you know, make all different types of applications, and people are continually trying to apply all kinds of weird things to different nations and different, you know, and this just happened, and that's prophesied here, and, and it gets ridiculous. But if we, if we take, and this is, you know, this was not meant, and, and God did not intend for the events of Revelation and for the events that are, that are going to happen in the future, he did not intend for them to be confusing. Satan would love for you to be confused about it. Man does a pretty good job of confusing the word of God also. right? The natural man definitely receiveth not the things of God. So all the false prophets and just unsaved people out there in the world, yeah, they're going to have a hard time understanding this stuff too. But for everyone who's saved... It's actually a very simple, there's some very simple concepts here. And um, I remember the first I had heard of, of the day of the Lord or the timing of the rapture and things like that. I had never really had much uh, teaching on this growing up. So before I was saved or even after I was saved going into churches, I never got the, you know, the pre-trib rapture just hammered in my head like so many people have. But when I sat through preaching and, and, and heard you know, just, just can see clearly what the, what's being taught in the Bible. It's actually very, very simple and straightforward. And, you know, all of that said, just to, just to say this, you know, when you see some pivotal events in the Bible, look up all the times are referenced, and it's going to help you just get a clearer picture of what's going on. I mean, that just makes sense no matter what, no matter what it is. When you, see, when you see certain topics just brought up multiple places, look at all those places that give you a full understanding and knowledge of what's going on. Here we see the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a special day. And, and as we get into this, you're going to see that this isn't just like some random day being called the day of the Lord. This isn't talking about the first day of the week being called the day of the Lord. This is, this is a specific day, a point in history where it's very, very, very significant. And the Bible refers to it as a day of destruction, a day of wrath, and all these things. And we're going to see that as we look at all of the other references in Scripture to the day of the Lord. Now, this is something that I'm, in, I'm going to encourage you to do your own Bible study on. I'm going to reference tons of scripture today, but we don't have time to really dig into every single one of those. But what you're going to see is that it's, first of all, is that it's completely legitimate to look at these, these, these references to the day of the Lord. And I think it's pretty obvious you'll be able to see it's all talking about the same day. It's not talking about all these different times and, oh, well, there's this day of the Lord, but then there's this day of the Lord, but then there's that day of the Lord. It's one event because the events that happen are so catastrophic and they're mentioned in all the references to one degree or another. You're going to have these things that tie it all together that you, it's clearly talking about the same day. And this is going to be important because there are some places where the day of the Lord is mentioned that also then ties in with the timing of the rapture. That also ties in with the, with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is what we're looking for. It's, it's, it's one of the things that's coming soon that we are expecting to see. You know, we're expecting to see an antichrist. We're expecting to see some, some great tribulation. And we're expecting to see our Lord Jesus Christ come in the clouds and, and save us out of our tribulation. 
Now, if that happens in our lifetime, that's what we're expecting to see. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But we know that these events are going to happen. And the day of the Lord is a very pivotal day to understanding and kind of unlocking timing of end times events. So when you're reading through Revelation, you can see references to, you know, oh, this must be the day of the Lord. Well, okay, let's see what happens in Isaiah. Let's see what happens in, you know, Thessalonians. Let's see what happens in Matthew. Let's see what happens in Joel. Let's see what happens in Obadiah. Let's, see, let's look at these passages and we can start seeing, oh, wow, I could see how this all fits and it's all talking about the same time and you get different details and information about it. But it's going to make it so that there are many theories you'll be able to just completely throw out the window if you just understand even just the day of the Lord. You just understand what the day of the Lord is, then you'll be able to say, well, that doesn't make sense, 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 because I know about the day of the Lord. I know when this happens. I can see the events that happen here. There is no, you know, you, you can't, you, people have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to make these other theories work, but when you understand when this happens and, and what it's all about, it's very straightforward. So we're going to dig into that. Let's, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to just go through every single verse of Isaiah 13 because there's, there's so much on this topic I want to get into. And I'm going to make mention of this without proving it because there's not enough time, but I wanted to get into this too. Just food for thought and go look this up and study it out on your own. When, if you're going to do a study on the day of the Lord, also include the day of Christ. And I'm going to, I'm going to just give you this without proving it. The day, of the, Christ, the day of Christ is the same day as the day of the Lord. But it's not exactly the same event. The day of Christ is always a day, uh, is a positive day. It's something to look forward to. It's something that's, that's really expected and we can't wait for and the reason why is because that's when the believers are going to be saved when jesus christ appears in the clouds the day of christ is at hand hey day jesus christ comes back that's a glorious day for every believer that is a wonderful day because he's coming to save those that are being persecuted out of this life and he's coming back and we're going to receive new bodies we're going to be caught up together with them in air and and these great things are going to happen so that's a great positive event but the same day that all the believers are taken up out of this world is the same day that God pours out his wrath on this world. And that's the day of the Lord. And that's the day that is not a day to look forward to. That's a day of destruction. That's a day of gloom. That's a day of wrath. But they both, those events happen on the same day. And, and again, that's a whole sermon in and of itself. I could prove that to you, but go ahead and do the study for yourself. And if you already believe that, Great, but prove it with Scripture. You say, oh, I've heard preaching on this before. I understand that. But can you prove it? Have you, have you really diligently searched out this, the Scriptures and did the study to, to know, yes, this actually is what this says, and nothing is taken out of context, and this is literally what the Bible says? Do that for yourself. I encourage you to do that. It's a great thing. It's a great study to do, and it's kind of fun. Right? I mean, I, I don't know about you. I, I, love, I love doing Bible prophecy. I think this is... There's a lot of fun stuff here. So um, anyhow, like I said, that's, that's as far as I'm going to go with that. I wanted to cover that, but not enough time. Verse number one, the Bible says the burden of Babylon. And even this, the burden of Babylon, <laughs> there's, there's so many topics to get into. So many. I'm going to focus on the day of the Lord, but, but it also has to do with Babylon. It starts off with Babylon before even getting into the day of the Lord. Um, Babylon is, is also another key throughout Scripture. Let's keep reading here. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Now, just one other point, too. In Isaiah chapter 13, as I mentioned before, there's different chapters that kind of are grouped together. This is obviously starting a new thought process, a new, a, a, you know, it's not, it's not linked in with chapter 12 as just a continuous thought. This is a new, now, it, it's very similar as far as the, the content goes, right? Like, this is the... Uh, there was still a lot of end time stuff being brought up in the previous chapters, but this is like a new, it's a new start, it's a new vision. This is something that Isaiah is seeing now in a vision that God gave him. So it, it, it's, it's kind of standing on its own here, starting off with something new. Verse number two, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. This is God's week. I've commanded my sanctified ones. This is saved people as we sanctified. 
I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger. Now, it's not that God's angry with his mighty ones or with the sanctified ones. He's saying for mine anger because God's angry with other people, and he's calling up his chosen, his sanctified ones to go forth, even them that rejoice in my highness, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. So God is basically just bringing his troops, right? He's bringing all his people with him to a battle. Verse 5, they come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. So God's coming to bring judgment and to, to bring destruction, right? So he's saying he's bringing his people from the, you know, from, um, what does it say, the, the, from one end of heaven to that, where, where, why can't I see that right now? There it is, from the end of heaven, verse 5. From the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. So this is the day, this is the day of the Lord. It's describing. He's coming with his people to destroy the whole land. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Not a good day, not a pleasant day. The day of the Lord is not a day that we should be looking forward to, that anybody should be looking forward to, because it is a day of destruction. Verse number seven, therefore shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Now, you can go through other portions of scripture. Again, I don't even have all of them to go through tonight. I'm focusing just on where the Bible specifically says the day of the Lord. But you can see where the, where the Bible says when Jesus comes back, when the when they're going to say to the, they're going to run into the dens and the caves and the mountains, they're going to say, fall on us, right? For the great day of the Lord is at hand. And we're going we're to read some of those passages, but this is what the same event that's going on. People are going to be scared. They're going to be trembling when the day of the Lord is at hand, when the day of the Lord comes, because it's a day of destruction. Verse number nine, behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. Now, again, just a side note, people need to understand who the Lord is. People right now, unfortunately, have no respect for the Lord, no respect for God, because they have this concept and they've built up this God, like the Sodomites who want to say, you know, God is love and love is love and, you know, everything's just love, 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 and there's no... There's no repercussions. There's no judgment. There's no bad things that are going to happen. We can just live in whatever filth and wickedness we want to, and it's okay because God is loving and God's forgiving and God doesn't care and God made me, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. You don't know the Lord. And, and people take the Lord's mercy and long suffering as a sign as if he's never going to come. As if he's never going to judge. He's never getting angry. So, you know, they just have this false view of who the Lord is, thinking that he doesn't get angry. And some people out there literally believe that God doesn't get angry. That he's just like, oh, he just looks at us as little children. And, you know, wherever, and those are the people that think, like, everybody's going to heaven. Every, you know, it's not a... And those are also people that aren't trusting in Christ, obviously. But people need to understand, I mean, this, this message needs to be heard. This needs to be preached. Hey, the day of the Lord's coming. It's not going to be a pleasant day because once that day comes, man, watch out. This could be too late for a lot of people because God's coming to destroy. He's coming to bring wrath. The Bible says it's cruel. Cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land Desolate. Desolate means empty. God's going to come and just wipe out the earth and just destroy. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Verse number 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Very pivotal event. The stars and the constellations not giving their light, the sun being darkened, and the moon being darkened, basically is what, is what this is saying right here. 
So again, this is not something that happens multiple times in history where all you know, these major stellar events are happening. It happens once. And this is something that you can go to then other portions of scripture. You're going to see the same type of thing referenced. And um, it's, it's pretty easy to see that this is talking about that event. It, it's, so, it's so significant, so pivotal, you could, you could go like, okay, yep, that's where it happens. And you could mark up in your Bible and, and put this, you know, all the passages side by side. Print them out. Print out the scriptures. Make a timeline you know, and see, okay, this fits in here, this fits in here. I guarantee you it's going to help you just in your own understanding of these things and to really know it, not just have heard it, not just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know the tribulation is, you know, before the rapture, but like to know a lot about this stuff, you need to study and you need to, to, to get it all out there. And it'll, it'll just help you have a full understanding. Um, let's keep reading verse number 11. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. So pride, loftiness, these are things that are, that are brought up. Arrogancy in ma many other places as well. This is the state of the condition of the world at the time of the day of the Lord. Verse 12, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts. Important word there, the wrath. This, is, this event, the day of the Lord, is God pouring out his wrath. We already saw earlier, it's a day that's cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger. Wrath being mentioned here. Wrath is an important term. Nowhere in the Bible do you see wrath being the same as tribulation unless it's the wrath of a man. The wrath of God is not trials and testing of saints. When God's pouring out his wrath, it's like it says here on the sinners to destroy He's not, he's not doing this for some chastening. The wrath of the Lord is, is him just, just pouring out his anger and fury and, and having destruction and doom and gloom. So when people say, well, it's not appointed on, you know, we're not appointed on the wrath, they're, they're right. And we're not going to be here for the day of the Lord. We'll be leaving on the day of Christ, which happens to be at the same time on the same physical day. Let's keep reading here, verse number 14. And it shall be as the chaste row, and as a sheep that no man taketh up, they shall every man turn to his own people and flee everyone into his own land. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through, and everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed to, dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. I mean, this is just terrible destruction. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. That's a terrifying thought of having some, a great army, some people come through, and they're not sparing anybody. I mean, you can't even, you know, you're in, there, you're in your house or your family, and you've got this, this you know, army coming through and just slaughtering people you might think well at least maybe they'll, they'll spare the kids they'll be safe they'll be nope they're not going to spare the, the, i mean they're going through and they're annihilating and they're wiping out and it's a judgment of god verse 19 and babylon the glory of the kingdoms the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So now it's likening the destruction of Babylon to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were laid to waste with the fire and brimstone from heaven raining down upon Sodom and Gomorrah to the point to where they're uninhabitable. And even to this day, Sodom and Gomorrah have been completely annihilated and nobody lives there. And there's places where people think Sodom and Gomorrah happened, and I think they're probably right. And there's evidence of, of you know, brimstone and this, you know, sulfur and, and everything that happens as a result. I've seen some cool uh, videos on that. But, I, I mean, I know that it's real. I know that it really happened. And, and that those places, when God, when God brings it to that level of destruction, you know, he says, hey, this is not going to be inhabited again. That's what he's going to do to Babylon. That's what he says in verse number 20. It shall never be inhabited, 
neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Now, kind of a side note, but it's something that's important. A lot of people have different opinions on this as well of what Babylon is or who Babylon is in the scripture because Babylon is talked about in Revelation chapter 17 and 18 and it talks about, you know, the great whore and, and this rich nation that is going to be judged of God that, you know, all the merchants and all the, you know, when the destruction comes, it's going to come real fast. In one hour, just, Babylon's going to be destroyed. And then everyone's just going to be going like, well, who's going to buy all of our stuff? And they were so rich and all this, you know, and that mighty, great Babylon. And it just was so exalted in the nations. And everyone, you know, just looked at the wealth of, of Babylon. Now, we have, a, I think we have a, the DVD here. If we don't, you know, Babylon USA, I was part of that DVD. I was part of that documentary. And, you know, that's what I believe is that, that, that Babylon that's pictured in the Bible is representative of the United States, at least whether it be the entire country or whether it be, you know, a portion of the United States. I believe it's, it's that's what uh, Babylon is representative of. Uh, I know people believe some different things. But the reason why I'm bringing this up right now is because when Babylon gets destroyed, Wherever Babylon ultimately is talking about, I don't think this is just talking about the physical, like original Babylon in the Middle East, but wherever this ends up, because that wouldn't even fit in with, with Revelation 17 and 18 at all. Like not, not, not at all. Obviously, there's, there's, the Bible uses nations as references of the spirituality of a place. So like Egypt was it was great at one time and, and just represents uh, the world and represents just kind of wickedness and, and sin of the world all throughout scripture, even past their, their heyday when, you know, now it's like no one considers Egypt some great world power or anything like that, but they were at one point. And the references to Egypt are just talking about how they were. And Babylon is, is something similar is that there's a new Babylon that's going to pop up or, or is here already. I mean, I believe it's here already, but um, it, it follows along the same spirituality that, that the old Babylon had, right? World kingdom, uh, things like that, or, or world power. And um, anyhow, that, that's, you know, people then want to say, you know, oh, it's Rome or Jerusalem. And the reason I bring this up is because I, it's impossible for it to be Jerusalem. Because when the Bible says it's never going to be inhabited, neither shall be dwelt in from generation to generation, you're going to see later that Jerusalem is inhabited. And, and, and there are going to be people living there. So if it's talking about physical Jerusalem, I, I don't see that happening. Jerusalem is a very pivotal place also that I believe may also be, be speaking in many cases uh, spiritually, but I think more often than not it's actually talking about physical Jerusalem because it makes mention to like the Mount of Olives, it makes mention to specific geographic locations that are, that are unique only to uh, Jerusalem. And, and it's very specific about that. And, and you know, going to the Mount of God where God's gonna set up his kingdom. I think that that's literally talking about where God is gonna set up his throne. And um, whereas some of the other places like Egypt and Babylon are referring to any nation who's, who's bringing forth the dead fruits thereof or the, you know, that, that's being used of Satan, kind of where Satan's seat is, right? Um, but the fact that when Babylon gets destroyed, the Bible says here it's never going to be inhabited again. I mean, it's just, it's going to be laid waste just like Sodom and Gomorrah was laid waste and just no one could live there anymore because when that level of destruction comes, you know, the, the land is just, is just defiled. Nothing can grow there anymore. Everything's just, just become uh, uninhabitable. So let's keep reading here, verse number 21, because, again, that's also a side note, and I'm already like 25 minutes into the sermon. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there, and the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. Turn, excuse me, turn if you would to Revelation chapter 18. So we're going to see the destruction of Babylon in Revelation 18. 
And you're going to see the similarities even with what we just read in Isaiah chapter 13. And I think Isaiah chapter 13, because the day of the Lord is prophetic, the, this destruction of Babylon is also prophetic because these are happening at the same time. The destruction of the day of the Lord, the destruction coming on Babylon, same thing in Revelation, the same events. Revelation 18, verse number 2, the Bible reads, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So we just saw that at the end of Isaiah 13. Wild beasts of the desert shall lie there. Their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. Owls shall dwell there. Satyrs shall dance there. Wild beasts. Right? It's just going to be, this is dragons. You know, th th this place of, 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 you know, it's uninhabitable except for all these, these creatures that um, are, are not creatures that are... Um, you know, people think positively of, right? That you would be like, oh, cows and horses and, th you know, and things that are going to be useful for man. And, you know, none of these things are, are, are good for, for man to dwell in. They're just going to be off in this, in this uh, desolate place, and they'll, they'll take over that place. So it's, it's basically describing the same type of destruction here. Verse number three, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And, and again, I mean, if you just want to keep on going down the list here of, of, you know, you could apply this to multiple, I think, nations right now. But who's spewing out fornication? I think like no other, it's going to be the culture of Western culture and the, the Hollywood and, and music of, of United States of America is pumping out debauchery, fornication, wicked, filthy, vile, disgusting perversion more so than any other nation in the world to the point where, I mean, we're the laughing stock and, and completely disrespected for any nation as any type of semblance of morality or normalcy when it comes to these types of things. I mean, it's, it's, it's disgusting. But anyways, this is, so this is, the Bible says, all nations, and all nations, it says, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. They're, all these nations are being influenced. How many other nations have such influence as the United States of America to, to bring their culture and their, I mean, look at the world today. How many people are speaking English in the world? I mean, we have a second language. Like, that's becoming the universal language. It is, yeah, I would say it is a universal language at this point of how many people are speaking the language, how many people are getting our media, our television, our movies, our, you know. It's amazing. I speak to people from other countries and even now, like our sports, someone was just telling me about the, they have friends, you know, in Europe, the big thing is soccer, right? And, and all across, uh, you know, in, uh, in most of the, the rest of the world, soccer is kind of like the, the, one of the main sports. And a lot of people follow soccer here, but it's not, it's not like the sport of the United States by any means. I mean, you think of like baseball or football or something like that. Are, are sports that are that are real popular here in the United States more so than anywhere else, but now even like the NFL is going is going abroad, and I hear about people are are buying all this gear and all this merchandise of these United you know, American football players and football teams and stuff. And it's not that I mean ultimately it's not that big of a deal, but it's just kind of amazing how the influence of the United States has just just spread so much. And you can you can talk to people. And like you talk to Americans, and most Americans don't really know what's going on in other parts of the world. But you talk to anyone like outside of America, and they all know what's going on in America. I mean, they really do. They know what's going on in the politics. They know what's going on in, in in sports. They know what's going on in movies and media. They know what's going on here because of the influence that the United States of America has. Because it's, it, we're that important of a, of a nation. This is the type of nation being described as Babylon, as having that level of influence. So when these events take place, if they were to take place real soon, like in my lifetime, I don't see how it can't be the United States. But let's keep reading. There's a lot more here. 
the rest of verse 3, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. I mean, talk about a nation who lives rich, right? Verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled to her double, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. I mean, you talk about this, the safety mindset of the people of the United States have, like, pff, nothing could touch us. We've got the best military. We've got the strength. You know, no one can touch us. We're safe. We're, you know, we have all this rich lifestyle and nothing can happen to us. We don't care. Verse 8, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So Babylon's going to be judged, and it even talks about, you know, come out of her, my people, because, you know, hey, she's been persecuting you. Like, get out of her. She's going to be destroyed, and, and just as she was being bad to you, you know, we're going to, she's going to get double for her, for her persecution of you. Jump down to verse number 19 there in Revelation 18. The Bible says, And they cast dust on their heads. This is the people of Babylon. And cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and, ho and ye holy apostles and prophets. For God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And there's another reference, just like we saw in Isaiah. Hey, Babylon's going to be destroyed and be found no more at all. Like that destruction is just going to happen and they're going to be annihilated. Verse 22, And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and, the vo and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. The, the turning on Christians and Christianity in this country is coming. It's already started. It's, it's, it's started slowly. It's, it's going to be with the, the free speech and the, you know, the censorship and these types of things, the canceling, the cancel culture. But you better believe it's going to ramp up. I have no idea how fast it's going to ramp up, but who knows? I mean, it could ramp up. I mean, it doesn't take much for these things to kick off. It really doesn't. I mean, you might think, no, no, that could never happen. Oh, there's way too many people. Yes, it can happen. It doesn't take much. I mean, I'm already starting to see, I don't know if you've noticed too, like even, again, this is just the censorship part. This is just the very beginning. But we, we're not even streaming to our main channel tonight because we got hit with another hate speech strike. And... You figure, oh, yeah, Pastor Burns is probably one you're preaching on to homos or whatever or something like that. Nope. It's actually Brother Devin, you hateful preacher. Man, it's the last time I ever have you fill the pulpit, huh? You're getting us strikes on our channel. And, it was a, and I think I listened to your sermon. It was on gluttony or something. Like, I don't remember anything hateful coming out about that. Maybe you fat shamed somebody. I don't know. It was a... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what, like, like, what, what could have been? Who knows? But lots of people are getting shut. I mean, I, I don't expect our YouTube channel, by the way, to, to stick around much longer. So it's been fun, but don't be surprised if it's gone. Tune in to, to Facebook while that's there, and uh, we'll find other means of, of live streaming and stuff if you're not here. But ultimately, you know what? You just got to be here. You just make sure you make it to church anyways, you know? Live stream's cool, but make it to church. 
But that's, I mean, this is just the beginning. And I've noticed like a lot of other channels I think are getting strikes and, and being, it, it must be because COVID is like far enough away because they've been focusing on that so much. Now they're like, oh wait, no, we got to get back to all the other censorship that we were doing. We, we were enjoying a, a time of peace while all the attention was, it was on that. But now, now it's like, oh, okay, well, vaccines, so everyone's safe, so let's go back to, to persecuting free speech in other ways. Anyhow, where were we? Yeah, we, anyway, turn if you would, turn to, turn to Exodus chapter, th or excuse me, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 30. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 30. I'm going to read from Jeremiah chapter 46. And you could write these references down if you want to look them up later. Now, now we're going to get into the day of the Lord. I wanted to bring up Babylon since Babylon was brought up. The beginning of Isaiah chapter 13 is the burden of Babylon, right? This is, this is preaching against Babylon and saying what's going to happen to Babylon, right? So we kind of looked a little bit at Revelation chapter 18. You can look at Revelation 17 and 18 to get more on Babylon in Revelation. And elsewhere in the Bible, but now we're going to focus on the day of the Lord. Multiple references I have in my notes here. I, I, there's no way I'm going to get to them all, so don't worry. I'm, I'm not going to make sure I just get to every single reference that I have in my notes. But you'll start to see there, there's some very, very important ones that we have to hit. Um, uh, you're in Ezekiel chapter 30. I'm going to read from Jeremiah 46, verse 10. The Bible says, for this is the day of the Lord, God of hosts, a day of vengeance. So there's God righting wrongs, right? He's, he's making sure that judgment comes for people who deserve it. God is bringing vengeance on people that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Go up into Gilead and take balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. In vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. It's a day of destruction that you... <laughs> there's no recovering from. There's no help. It doesn't matter what you try to do. God's coming, and he's going to come and destroy. It says he's going to be made satiate and made drunk with their blood. I mean, if that doesn't scare people, I, I don't know what will. It's, and the people, reason why anyone wouldn't be scared at that is because they don't think, they don't, they don't believe, they don't, they don't know who God is. They don't know God at all. It's time to take heed. Ezekiel chapter 30, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Howl ye, woe worth the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. Why is it be the time of the heathen? Because the heathen are just going to be ruling and reigning, going nuts, and just and, and, and going after the saints. The heathen are going to be in their heyday. It's the time of the heathen. Verse 4, And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia, when the slain shall fall in Egypt, and they shall take away her multitude, and her foundation shall be broken down. Ethiopia, and Libya, and Lydia, and all the mingled people, and Chub, and the men of the land that is in league, shall fall with them by the sword. Thus saith the Lord, They also that uphold Egypt shall fall. And the pride of her power shall come down. From the tower of Syene shall they fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. And they shall be desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her city shall be in the midst of the cities that are wasted. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I have set a fire in Egypt, and when all her helpers shall be destroyed. And again, here's a reference to Egypt, but Egypt's another one of those uh, places in Scripture I just brought up earlier that's, that's looked at and viewed at as a wicked nation, as a, as a, as a wicked people. Um, and it says that the pride of her power shall come down. So this will be the, day, the time of the heathen. They're going to be super full of, of pride, and they're going to be brought down. Turn to Joel, the book of Joel. And actually, all of Joel is just has tons of scripture on the day of the Lord specifically, but end times prophecy more generally. And we're going to look at all three chapters of Joel, just because there's so much, there's so much here. Yeah. Well, 
We're going to go to Joel. I'm going to skip Amos and Zephaniah, I think. We might look at Amos. Oh, cool. This is dead, so now I don't know how long I've been preaching for. <laughs> this is my timer. This is, this is a backup audio, and it tells me how long I've been preaching for. So I look down, and I'm like, oh, it's been 25 minutes. Oh, it's been 30 minutes. Now I don't know. <laughs> and, and I'm not good at doing math when I'm up here. I'm looking at the clock. Well, I don't know what that means. When did we start, right? <laughs> Who knows if that clock's even right? So I just got a lot more time. Just kidding. Joel, yeah, we're going to, and, and make note, if you're making notes, look at Zephaniah, because I'm not, I'm going to skip over Zephaniah, we're not going to go to Zephaniah, there's lots of, lots of, uh, of scripture there as well, Zephaniah chapter 1, we're going to skip that completely, but look at Joel chapter 1, verse number 13, the Bible reads, gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, howl, ye ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God, sanctify ye a fast, Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. So he's basically saying, look, you need to, to howl and repent and come in with sackcloth and you know, bring these sacrifices because it's not a good day. Because the day of the Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord is here, it's destruction. You better fall on your face and tell God how sorry you are and repent in sackcloth and ashes. This is, this is how he's even just leading up to the day of the Lord, saying, you know, watch out for this woeful day. Go to chapter 2, verse number 1, Joel 2, verse 1. The Bible says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Now, before I continue, I just want to point this out again. A day of clouds, thick darkness, gloominess, darkness, this fits in perfectly with the sun and moon being darkened. And with the stars not giving their light, it's going to be a time of dark. I mean, you just think about it. If sun and moon are darkened, those are our sources of light. And the stars are darkened and fall from heaven. There's not going to be any light. It's a day of darkness. So when we see these events happening, it's talking about the day of the Lord. And you can start matching up, okay, when did all these things happen? And I, I'm repeating myself now, but I'm repeating myself on purpose because I want to hammer this point home. Because as soon as we're done with this, I'm going to be done with the Old Testament and we're going to move to the New Testament. See, people don't have that much of a problem with the Old Testament prophecies. When it comes to, pro when it comes to this stuff, people, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, the day of the Lord, yeah, oh, sure. You know, they, but they have a problem applying it to when it actually happens and applying it to the New Testament in context. To see, this is talking about the same thing. Because when, when all of a sudden we get to the New Testament, people want to say, oh, this is this event, this is that event, this is something else, and this is to these people, and this is to the Jews, and this is, you know, and they start just, just tearing the Bible apart, trying to make sense of it all, when really if you spent enough time in Ezekiel and in Joel and in Zephaniah and in Isaiah, then you'd go, by the time you get to the New Testament, you'd be like, oh, yeah. I mean, this is obviously talking about the same thing. And you go to Revelation, you go to Thessalonians, you go to Matthew, and you start seeing the same events. And it'll be, it should be familiar to you. But if you're not reading your Bible and all you're doing is listening and reading other books and reading the Word of Man and listening to what your buddies have to say and not getting into Scripture yourself, then sure, I could see how you might just be confused about it. But we're going over this in detail because it's important, because once you see all the similarities, and then we go to the New Testament, you're going to be like, duh, it's obvious. It is obvious. And it's only not obvious to people who are too, pride and too proud and too arrogant to admit that they're wrong about something, or to people who just don't want to study their Bible at all, or have some other reason, or to just, I mean, I don't see how you can be too stupid. Because it's, because it's so obvious. I, like, I don't even th feel like that's an option. I mean, you have to be mentally handicapped to not understand. And even then, I think 
you know, I'd be insulting people who are mentally handicapped, saying, yeah, I can understand this. Seriously. I mean, I'm, I'm half joking, but it's, it's so, it's, there's, it, this comes up so much, and, and all the evidence is right there. I mean, you have to be an imbecile not to, not to see it. And the reason is because God doesn't want us questioning it. He wants us to understand and know, okay, yeah, this is, you've warned us about this, Lord. He tells us, he told his disciples in Matthew 24, hey, when, when shall these things be? When is the end of the world? When is your coming? They asked him the question and he answered it. Imagine that. God wanting his people to know. I mean, isn't that why he would give us a book that's called Revelation, like revealing? Hey, here's what's going to happen in the end days. Hey, here's what's going to happen. He was even trying to tell his disciples about his own death, burial, and resurrection, saying, hey, I'm telling you this now so you don't be offended. I'm telling you now so you know that when this happens, you know, this is all promise. I'm, I'm telling you this in advance. I'm preparing you. I'm warning you. Jesus was always doing that. He's always trying to warn and say, look, you need to know this. The apostles were doing that. You get the scripture in the New Testament saying, look, I'm just trying to warn you. We're trying to prepare you. You know, whether it be about wolves and sheep's clothing, whether it be about, you know, all these different things, all these different events, you need to be prepared. God wants us prepared. When there's great tribulation coming up, he wants you to be prepared. So he made it, he made it pretty simple. And if you read your Bible, it's pretty obvious. It does not require very much effort to understand the doctrine. Because it's laid out for you. Just let the Bible teach you. Chapter 2, Joel, verse number 1, let's read. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my, in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, clouds, thick darkness. We read this already. Look at verse number 3. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden, before them and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Now, I totally do not have the time to get into this, but I believe, and, and, and I, I saw this, I don't remember how many years ago, but you can make a note to read Revelation chapter 9 later and see if you can see similarities between what's being described here and the locusts that bring the plague in Revelation chapter 9. I think it's talking about the same thing. You check it out for yourself. I do not have the time to draw the parallels between the two, but that is also pretty cool. When you look at this, the, the destruction, it says a fire devours before them and behind them a flame burneth. So they're just destroying as they go and as they continue to move forward, just like the locusts in Revelation chapter 9, what do locusts do? They, they come into a land and they just start destroying and behind them it's just completely waste and desolate. That's the exact same picture that you see there and it says uh, the appearance of them is the appearance of horses just like the locusts have the appearance of horses and as horsemen so shall they run and like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle ray there's, so there's, it, they sound like a bunch of, of you know um, galloping horses right just like this great sound of this great army of horses just running again Read Revelation chapter 9, I think it fits right in. Verse 6, before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. And the, the locusts were also had stings where they were to sting the people. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march everyone on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they shall... When, when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. It's this great armor, right? And, and again, read Revelation chapter 9. I think this is amazing. And even verse number 9 here, it says, They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. I mean, it's giving this a, a human description or human-like, you know, you're a thief, but, but when you think about maybe that being like a locust, just coming and enveloping and climbing up the walls and getting in the windows and just getting into play, like, I'm telling you, 
There's something to it. Verse 10, the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Jump down to verse number 28. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in a remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, real quickly, too, when we're looking at the Old Testament prophecies, it's not always as nice and neatly organized as it is, say, in the book of Revelation, where you've got a lot of things in chronological order. You're going to have th you know, events being, being brought up, and a lot of it's because it's dual prophecy, a lot of it because some of it is apply applicable then and some of it's now, and because God was more cryptic in his prophecies in the Old Testament. I mean, it's just a fact. That's the way it is. Just like all these prophecies of Jesus Christ weren't the most obvious in the world, but it's a lot easy to see when you look back and be like, wow, yeah, this is all amazing. But when you're just reading the Bible, it doesn't necessarily all stand out to you. And I'll be honest with you, if we didn't have so much of the light of the New Testament just pointing it out, it would probably be a, take a long time for someone like me to figure out that, oh, that's talking about Jesus. But I know most of them because the Bible points you to them. Yeah, this is about Jesus. This is about Jesus. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Wow, look at that. Right? Chapter 3. Go to Joel chapter 3. I'm trying to hurry up here because we need to get to the New Testament. But notice how it says that the sun shall be turned into darkness in chapter 2. Bef and, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So this is an event that happens right before the day of the Lord. Just like we've seen in other passages in the Old Testament. Look at verse number 11 of Joel chapter 3. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the earth be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Remember, it's a, day, it's a time of the heathen. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Isn't it amazing? Again, making mention of the sun and moon being darkened, and the stars are drawing their shining, and it also talks about a reaping. Oh, but Joel has nothing to do with Matthew. Nothing to see here. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Amos 5, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And this is where people will mock the, the you know, post-tribbers. The Bible says in, Mo, in Amos 5.18, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Say, oh, you guys desire the day of the Lord. Oh, you think we're going to be here? Like, no, you don't even understand. You don't even understand the position. If you're going to try to bring this up and say, oh, you desire the day of the Lord, no, I don't. We're going to be gone at the day of Christ, and then the day of the Lord starts after that. Because the day of the Lord is a day of great wrath, and we're not here for his wrath. But, but the reason why people say things like that is because in their mind, they haven't separated tribulation from wrath. That's the real, I mean, for anyone who's honest... That would be the reason why. Because, because in their mind, they're thinking tribulation lasts seven years, and during the seven years, God's doing all these horrible things to the earth. And because that's what people remember is all the things that God does to the earth. But that's not the tribulation, my friends. The 
time before that is a great tribulation. When the Antichrist is persecuting the Christians like they've never been persecuted before. Ever. I mean, it's just way worse than has ever been experienced. That's the great tribulation. And then, as a result, God pours out his wrath. When you understand that, and you understand that the whole seven-year period, yes, there's a seven-year period, but there's a, there's a breaking point right in the middle that divides tribulation from wrath. When you understand that, everything fits perfectly. Perfectly. So let's say, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. You know, like, don't you know what Amos 5 says? To what end is it for you, the day of the Lord is darkness and not light, as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. So basically saying, like, there's no getting out of, of the destruction, right? It's like, whew, I just got away from that lion, and then rawr, there's this bear here. You're like, there's this, you know, there's, there's, there's no way. Like, you think you're going to avoid destruction. You can't. I just made it safe in the house. Whew. And then, and then a snake bites you, right? That's what he's saying. Like that, that's what the day of the Lord's like. So what, you know, why would you desire that? You don't think, you know, and the people who think they've got all their bunkers and their, you know, their homes underground, all the, the preppers, you know, hey, that could be kind of fun, but you're not going to be able to hide from the face of the Lord. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna go into there and, and there's going to be some snake coming in and, and killing you in your bunker or whatever. You think that you're going to be safe. You ain't going to be safe. Don't look forward to the day of the Lord. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. First Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of, haven't we just been reading all these scriptures about the day of the Lord? Okay, but what is it that people want to quote to you when they try to say that the rapture can happen at any time? Well, say it's just like a thief in the night, right? Well, what happens, according to the Bible, as a thief in the night? The day of the Lord. Now, this is important because I believe the rapture happens just before the day of the Lord, so that is applicable. The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the light. But this is a very important point to admit to, saying this is talking about the close proximity timing of the rapture, the day of the Lord. Because pre-trib pre -trib rapture believers will not want to admit that because it's going to hurt them elsewhere in Scripture. Actually, real close by this in Scripture, too. But um, we're starting off with just, if you just read this, no preconceived ideas, hey, that's bringing up the day of the Lord. Right, come to the thief. Okay, that's fine, but I know all about the day of the Lord. I know about the day of the Lord, talking about the sun and moon being darkened, and, and you know, the stars falling from, I, 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 yeah, that's what the day of the Lord's talking about, right? The day of darkness, sure, okay, well, that, that's going to come as a thief of night, okay. Verse 3, for when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. It sounds just like what we've been reading, right? You're not going to get away from it. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. So when it just said, the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night, is it talking about believers, the brethren, who are of the light? No. It says right there. So, so if someone's going to tell you, oh, well, you can't know it because it's a day of darkness. You, you don't know when it is. It's going to come like a thief in the night. Uh, yeah, I do, actually, because the Bible said right here that we're, we're not in darkness. Those that are in darkness, yeah, it's going to come on them like a thief in the night. Children of darkness. But we're children of light. We're receiving the warning. We're understanding what the Bible's talking about here. Oh, yeah, that's not going to come on us as a, as, a, as a thief. First of all, the day of the Lord isn't going to come on us anyways, but we're, you know, it's definitely not going to overtake us as a thief because we'll have already know when, when Jesus comes back, we're going, now he's going to pour out his wrath. Ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Verse 6, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 
For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, and that's where that verse comes from. God hath not appointed us to wrath, which is the wrath of the day of the Lord, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now, let's back up, because verse 1 that we already read in chapter 5 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need I write unto you. This is conjoining chapter 4, the end of chapter 4, right? But of the times and seasons. What times and seasons? The times and seasons that he was just talking about in chapter 4. Before there was even a chapter division in the Bible, when he's writing this letter to the Thessalonians, to the church of the Thessalonians, going, okay, I'm writing you this whole letter. In chapter 4, he was writing of the times and the seasons, and then refers to those same times and seasons in verse 2 in chapter 5 as the day of the Lord. So let's go back and get that context from chapter 4. I mean, do you see how this works? Like this is, if we just want to look at the Bible and have it teach us, I think this makes sense. Verse 13 of chapter 4, we'll start getting context from that verse. And, and you know what? Read the whole chapter later. Please, read the whole book. Read the whole Bible. Get it all in context. Prove it. Prove all things. But I, I think we're looking at a significant amount of Scripture tonight, though. And I'm not just cherry-picking verses. I mean, we're getting a pretty good, decent context. We're going to read verses 13 through 18 right now after we already read the first 10 verses of chapter 5. Verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, the asleep is talking about people who have passed away, people de dead in Christ, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Hey, that's good news. You have loved ones that were saved that were in Christ that have passed away, we don't have to really be sorrowful because we know just as much as we believe that Jesus died and rose again, hey, even those now that have fell, fallen asleep, that we've lost, our loved ones, Jesus, that, that sleep in Jesus, God's going to bring them with him. We're going to see him again. He's going to bring them with him. When? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Well, I think this is talking about the coming of the Lord, don't you? Uh, it's what the Bible says. So if Jesus Christ already came one time, and this is the coming of the Lord, hmm, one plus one. Yeah, I think this is the two, the second coming of the Lord. The second coming of Jesus Christ. We which are alive and remain on the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, cover one another with these words. If you don't say that's a rapture, then you don't even believe in a rapture. Because this is the passage that, that clearly articulates that we are going to be caught up together, which is what the word rapture is even meaning and, and defining, being caught up together with the Lord in the air. But don't stop at chapter 4 because he continues to give more information in chapter 5. So we just got done seeing that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then continues in chapter 5 saying, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need to write unto you. Because it could happen at any time. No. Because yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. But you know what? It's not a thief unto you. It's a thief unto those that are in darkness, but not unto you. Well, no one even know. No one knows anything about any time that it could just happen right now. It could happen today. It could happen two seconds from now. No, that's not what the Bible is saying there at all. You're not in darkness that the days will overtake you as a thief. 
Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to close with this. 2 Peter chapter 3. Because I know it's, it's a longer sermon tonight, but there's so much to get into. There's so much to get into. Because the day of the Lord is found so much in Scripture. Actually, I don't know if I'm going to close with this. I might, I might go to one more place. Because I can't resist. I'm repenting. Second Peter chapter 3. This, is, this will be the last reference specifically of the day of the Lord in Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And this is again just referring to that great destruction that's coming with the day of the Lord. And you could read way more in detail on it in the book of Revelation. The day of the Lord coming as a thief. These are the places that mention that at all. Now, again, let's go to Matthew 24. I'm going to close with Matthew 24. Everything has been consistent in the descriptions for the day of the Lord. But what's funny is that people want to say things to tell you that you can't know at all any idea when the rapture might happen, using these verses about the day of the Lord. But then when the same events of the day of the Lord are mentioned, then they want to say it's something else. Or they don't want to draw the correlation, or they, or, or they can't follow all the scriptures being taken together. I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I, I, it's a... If you try to, to pin someone down on these truths that, that teaches against what the Bible is saying or is trying to promote their, their pre-trib doctrine, it's, it's always uh, moving in goalposts and just, well, what about this and what about that and what about that, you know. Be careful with getting caught up into that type of, like if, if you're talking to someone, obviously, you know, we don't go out to debate people and just like get in, involved in these uh kind of fleshly arguments and things that are ultimately going to be vain. But if you have a brother or sister in Christ that you're talking to, and, and you know, obviously you love talking about the Bible and, and different things come up, and, and you can talk about you know, doctrine and things you believe and you're passionate about, and you know, it's okay to have disagreements with people and whatever and try to prove things and show that to people. And if you're doing that with someone, I would just recommend, and, and just when it comes to anything, don't let people just try to squirm out of, of you know, when you're trying to show them. So I'm like, no, look, you have to acknowledge this. Make them see the point. Be like, don't move on past that. Even if you could answer it, don't let people just jump around because just at least get them to admit. Because then you've made progress. If you could at least get them to admit, okay, do you see what this says right here, though? Because if they're just going to keep jumping around, they're never going to accept anything of what you say and always think that there's another explanation. But, you know, make them, they're like, look, do you, do you see what the Bible says about the day of the Lord? Do you see this? Okay, we've seen that. We've seen that, I think, established enough tonight in the Old Testament and the New, about the day of the Lord. Well, let's look at Matthew 24 now. And let, let's see if this matches up with the context, with everything else that we've seen. And, and let's just read what it says. And if you look even at the beginning, I, I've already brought this up before, but it stands just to look at it. Just look down at verse number um, 1. 
The Bible says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto him, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What things? Not one stone not being left upon another. Destruction, right? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they know he's going away, and they're asking of, of his coming. Didn't we just read about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5? And when it's talking about his coming, it also referenced the day of the Lord? Sounds like they happen really close together. Well, we're not going to read all of Matthew 24, but he goes on to, to talk about the wars, rumors of wars, and false Christ, and, and then this, this time, the beginning of sorrows, that, that was all that stuff. He says, they're going to deliver you up, and they're going to kill you, and you're going to be hated of all nations, and that iniquity is going to be abounding, because maybe it's the time of the heathen, and the gospel is going to be preached in all the world. And then he, says, he brings up the abomination of desolation, which, again, is another pivotal moment. Look up when abomination of desolation occurs. That happens less times in Scripture, much less, much less frequently, but it's still a big event. Because he says, when you see this happen, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. I'm in verse 17. Let him which is on the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. So that looks like an event that's a very significant event. There's another homework assignment. Go read about that and see when that's going to happen. Go to Daniel and read about the, the abomination of desolation. And woe unto them that are with child, and them to give suck in those days. But pray you that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath, for then shall be great tribulation. You want to know where the term great tribulation is coming from? You're not going to find it anywhere else but right here. People are talking about the tribulation. Well, I don't mean the tribulation. I mean the great tribulation. Even better. Because if you want to know when the great tribulation is talking about, that's referenced once in Matthew, Matthew 24. Once in the Bible here. It's right here, Matthew 24. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. When's the time of your coming? What are the signs of your coming? Great tribulation. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Verse 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I just tried explaining this to someone the other day that was referencing, you know, like, you know, making some really nice persons, one of my friends, but, but you know, doesn't understand this doctrine, okay? And was just brought up some, kind of making a joke about, like, because you know what people believe in pre-trib, and you just kind of joke around, like, oh, man, I came out, and there's no one around, and I thought that the rapture happened, and all this other stuff. And I'm like, but it's not going to be a secret. I mean, the Bible says, for as the lightning shineth from the east even unto the west, from one end of heaven to the other, like we just read here, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Look, every eye is going to see him. It's not a secret event. It's not something like, oh, man, everyone's gone. I was sitting in church, and I was the only one left. Everybody's gone. What happened? No, that's not Jesus coming back. Because when Jesus comes back, he's coming back in the clouds. And when he's coming back, every eye is going to see it. And when he comes back, there's gonna be like, it's going to be like lightning that shoots across the entire sky. You can't miss it. It's a big event. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcasses, there will the eagles be gathered together. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, we already saw in the Old Testament the same description of the sun and the moon being darkened. 
We already saw the day of the Lord happens after that. But you know what happens before that? The great tribulation. Tribulation, sun and moon darken, day of the Lord. Or sun and moon darken, day of Christ, day of the Lord, I should say. Because look at what it says here. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and moon shall not give her light. Stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other. He's going to get his chosen ones. He's going to get the sanctified ones. He's going to get his saved. He's going to get the saints. That's what he's coming to do. Those who are elect, why are they elect? Because they're elect in Jesus. That's why they're elect. Jesus is the elect. So if you have Jesus, then you're elect too. Because Jesus is in you. That's why. Not because you were born of Abraham. God's able these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. Tribulation. Great tribulation. Sun and moon's darkened. Son of man comes in heaven. There's a reaping. There's a gathering. But then everybody else, they see what's going on. It's not a, oh, I wonder where everyone went. They see the lamb in heaven coming down in clouds coming down. And they're going, oh, no. Why? Why? Because they've just been persecuting all the people that God came back to collect. They're out there trying to kill these people, and then God shows up and says, nope. Uh-oh. We didn't think there was a God. We thought we were doing God's service. He came and took these people. Watch out, because now God's angry. Now the day of the Lord has begun. It's so simple. And there's so much more here. I mean, I keep looking down, I'm going like, no, we've been here long enough. It makes reference to the days of Noe and the days of Lot. And we already saw that description too with the day of the Lord. I mean, it, it fits together so perfectly. You have to literally fight and kick against the pricks to try to, to not believe what the Bible's talking about here with the day of the Lord and, and, and when God's gonna, Jesus is going to come back and when, and when the rapture is going to take place. It's so obvious. But the day of the Lord is mentioned a lot in the Old Testament, and I think one of the problems is preachers aren't really reading the Old Testament that much. Maybe read, I don't know, I don't think they're reading the Bible very much. And then what they are reading is very little, very sparse here and there, and cherry picking and just preaching on some things that they just want to, you know, tickle ears with or whatever. And if you spend the time reading and just reading and studying the Old Testament, you're going to see, wow, there's a lot of information here. And look, it matches up perfectly. It, do, it doesn't take a big, great Bible scholar to do the study that I just did at all. I mean, it, it, you read the Bible enough times, you're going to remember where to look at. You'll at least remember the book of Joel. I mean, all of Joel is about it. The whole book of Joel. Just read the book of Joel. And, and if you read the Bible enough times, you'll remember, man, yeah, Joel talking about end times event. That should be easy enough. Isaiah also, we're gonna, cause we're gonna, this is going to come up more and more. I'm not going to go in depth like I did tonight. But this is kind of the main chapter, Isaiah 13, uh, that really goes into it a lot. But it just, it's so riddled throughout the scripture. I encourage you to do your study. Do, do Bible study on this stuff. See it for yourself. Read, read all, I mean, man, if you, know, you want something to get some homework for, 
like I said, I barely was able, I mean, I feel like I barely was even able to get into this subject because there's, there's so much. There's so much correlation. There's so much there. Study it on your own. Don't just walk away going, well, Pastor Burson did a good enough job convincing me, or you've already been convinced in the past anyways. Study it out on your own. You know why that's important? You say, Pastor Burson, I'm never going to be a pastor one day. You know why it's important? Because maybe you can help teach someone else good doctrine. Maybe, instead of going, oh, we'll just listen to this sermon. Maybe you can take part in helping teach somebody. What do you think about that? What do you think about being able to know the Bible? Maybe you could teach your kids. Maybe you teach a new convert. Maybe you could open up the Bible because I'll tell you what, if you just, if you just hand someone, oh, watch this sermon, watch it. You know how often people don't do that? The friend that I was talking about, I gave him the information. Guess what? I gave him that a, long, a while ago. Quite a while ago. I was like, well, I see you didn't watch that video, did you? <laughs> because that's how people are, right? I mean, it's just, but if you take the time and you show them, I, I guarantee you most of them will probably just be interested anyways. Like, oh, wow, that's cool. Know it for yourself. Be able to show it. You'll know it that much better when you do your own study on it. Guaranteed. I'll tell you what, you know, go, before I started pastoring, and I was going to church faithfully. I was listening to a lot of sermons. I was doing a lot of Bible reading and everything else. But when I really started studying the Bible on my own and actually doing the work and trying to prove all things, when I really started doing that's when I really got a good grasp on these truths and then be able to teach it. Going to church for a long time is great. And, you know, and, and again, reading the Bible also helps with that too, but actually taking the time to do a study really go kind of takes you to the next level in your understanding. And that allows you to be a much better teacher to other people and it'll help keep it in your long-term memory. Because there's a lot of times you can learn things and then it, and then it goes. And it, it made perfect sense, but then you're like, man, yeah, I don't remember exactly what that was. And the more you do your study and the more you do the work, the the, the you're going to burn in your brain for that much longer. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for warning us, for teaching us, for guiding us, for, your, for giving us the truth. Lord, I pray that you please help us to um, know good doctrine and to be able to exhort and, and teach others, Lord. And, and God has asked that you'd open up our own wisdom and understanding. And, and God, there's nothing that, that I know that, has, that I haven't received from someone else and, um, you know, these, these aren't just thoughts of my own heart. Um, help us all remember to, to stay humble and not to get lifted up in pride with the knowledge that, that you've given us. Because it comes from you, because you've given it to us, dear Lord. Help us with, with humility to be able to teach and be able to instruct. And, uh, but also just to be bold and, and, and have the confidence of knowing your word uh, that comes through study. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.